a noise gate. Uh, that actually that stops the buzzing while you're not playing the instrument, and the sound of the instrument will will switch the noise gate off so that you can hear the uh, the signal coming through. So in actual fact, there is still buzzing going on when the instrument is playing, but uh, I'm going to be playing it quite loud anyway, so I'm, I'll destroy all the buzzing when I'm playing. No problem. So. Um, Another thing that I'd like to point out here is uh, because of the size of the room, uh, you'll probably have the same problem. You can't um, plug a, a big speaker in and blast it out. So I've bought myself a unit called a speaker simulator, which is a rack mount uh, unit. And I think you can actually get them in foot pedal form now, uh, guitar players. Um, this actually gives you the sound of a speaker without you having to uh, annoy the neighbours. So, so to give myself a little bit of encouragement as well while I'm playing it. I'll, I'll just stick a bit of echo in there. So, I'm not actually recording the echo onto tape, but it does help to uh, give it a bit of zing and get you going. Here goes then. OK, I've decided to, uh, that I, I might like to double track the rhythm guitar so that we can uh, put one over on the left and one over on the right and it does help to fill out the track quite a lot. Here we go. Well, that's the rhythm guitars done. I've also added a few more uh, lead guitar riffs to bolster the song up a bit, and I've added uh, a 12 string in one part and a 6 string bass in another part, which I thought uh, needed uh, to be done throughout the instrumental passages. Um, so we've got to the point now <clears throat> where there's something I did earlier, which was transfer the tracks that I would want to keep uh, that are currently on the computer over to tape. Um, so that we really don't need to use the computer anymore after that and we can just use the tape. Uh, but I'm not really keen on having computerised drums all the way through the song because it tends to get a little bit monotonous. So I'd like to record a proper drum kit. But obviously I've got the same sort of problems that you might have at home with the size of the room and uh, I can't set up a drum kit in here. So we'd, we're going to go on to another studio now to uh, to use the drum kit and also put on the vocals. Well, as you can see, we've been transported to another uh, studio. This is the Old Smithy Recording Studios, where I'm just about to do some live performance work, uh, vocals and stuff, and also I'd like to dump the uh, computer drums off and put some real live sweaty drums on. Right then, first of all we need to uh, mic up the drum kit, starting with the hi-hat, snare drum and bass drum. Right, we've got one microphone on the snare drum here, which is uh, just sort of hanging over the edge of the, the rim of the snare drum, but pointing towards the middle of the uh, drum itself, which is the best pickup point. And also, uh, the microphone on the hi-hat pointing towards the edge of the hi-hat rather than in towards the bell, otherwise it picks up too much clattering. Right, next, next uh, we'll have a bash at micing up the tom-toms. Ding! There you go. Now we'll bring in some overhead mics uh, for the cymbals and the top of the kit. We've got a separate microphone there for the 
to pick up the bell of the ride cymbal, which is always a good idea. Got uh, some microphones overhead here. It's a good idea if you've got a couple of spare mics to put a couple at the back of the room to pick up the ambience of the kit and the, and the room itself. It usually sounds quite good. Um, I find that cymbals pick up rather heavily on, uh, on drum tracks usually. And it's a good idea maybe to get the drummer to uh, set his kit up and then take his cymbals away and get him to actually play the track with no cymbals and just sort of hit me there and uh, then later on put the cymbals back on the kit and overdub the cymbals later and put them on separate tracks. Uh, and then you can actually control the volume of the cymbals more easily. Obviously it's really nice to have a good selection of microphones but it's also rather expensive. So what I would suggest if you're a bit stuck is get a good all-round microphone which you could get a Sennheiser like this for about 150 pounds. Or if you want to remortgage your house you could get this bigger one, which is a Neumann U87, which will record anything, which is fantastic. Or if you're really broke, you can get a, a PZM from a local Tandy or Radio Shack for about £35. And if you get a few of those, they'll mic up your drums adequately. Right now then, less of this wittering. Let's do a bit of bongo bashing. Here we go then. Put the old cans on so we can hear what we're doing. Here we go. OK, Paul, let's have a go. Righto, have a go at the uh, guitar solo. Take these off so I can see what I'm doing. Um, I prefer to put the speaker cabinet in the studio area and have a long lead from the speaker to my amplifier, which I put next to the mixer desk so that I can uh, change the settings at any time. Uh, it's probably a good idea if you don't sit in the studio with a pair of headphones on for ages and ages trying to play guitar parts because it's, it wrecks your ears, it really does. So let's have a little go. Okay, Paul. Right, believe it or not, we've made it as far as the lead vocal. Uh, for this, I like to use um, a Neumann U87 microphone, which is one of those big posh jobs. It's very nice indeed. Um, it's also quite interesting to set up uh, another microphone. I've got a Sennheiser there, uh, because you can mix the two sounds together, and it, it forms a sort of a slightly out of phase sound, which is quite interesting. And if you can't afford a nice pop shield like that, you can, uh, you can always get the gusset from your uh, girlfriend's pantyhose, stick it round uh, an old coat hanger, and uh, there you go, stick it in front of the mic like that. It works very well. So, here we go. Let's have a go at the lead vocal. <coughs> Clear the old uh, <coughs> frogs. OK, Paul. Right. I won't waste too much of your time trying to explain how we get the vocal backing together. But uh, if you want a nice sort of block vocal sound and you haven't got many tracks to play with on the tape, it's a good idea maybe to put your first vocal harmony, say, on track 11, and then together with track 11, which you've already recorded, bring up the live mic, get a mix between the two, and mix them both down as you go, as you sing live, 
down to say track seven. Then you've got your first vocal harmony double tracks. Do the same again, you can still use the same track 11 as your work track. Do your second vocal harmony on that. Uh, live mic again, uh, get a good balance between the two. Record it onto track eight and, and so on. So you've got, you've got da, 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 you've got seven, eight, nine, all with different harmonies on all double tracks. And then at the end of the day, <clears throat> you mix those three down onto another track, probably the work track that you've been using already, say 11 or 12, something like that. Mix them all down to the one track. And then when it comes down to mixing the whole thing, you haven't got to worry about whether the vocal harmonies are the right balance or not. That's quite a good idea. Welcome to the mixing stage. Um, it's a good idea before you start your mix, if you're working together with a recording engineer, to decide which tracks that you would like to be responsible for on the faders and plug them up accordingly so that they come up in your area. I usually find that because I've um, sung the vocals on the song, you tend to get a bit sort of slightly embarrassed about the sound of your own voice. So it's a good idea because the song is the main thing, the song is the most important thing to sell it, is to give that to the engineer to do. So Paul is going to be responsible for the vocals, vocal backing and guitar solo, all the instrumental type passages and I'll be responsible for the rhythm section just to make sure that, that we've still got some oomph. You may find that the more instruments you add to the track, that the original instruments that you put on like the rhythm section and the drums and all that sort of stuff, start to sound a little bit distant and don't sound quite so decisive as they were when you first put them on. So a good idea is starting with the drums, solo each instrument and change the EQ slightly to maybe brighten them up and get them to actually force their way through the, uh, the block vocal backing sound and the block guitar sounds so that they sound a bit more definitive. We, first of all uh, we bring the rhythm section in starting with the drums, usually the bass drum. Yep, a bit louder, yep. Okay. Yep, that sounds sort of reasonable at the moment. Um, as we go on and we add more instruments, we may have to change the EQ on the bass drum so that it comes through a bit more. <laughs> Snare drum is okay. Higher. We might, as we go along, we may add a bit of echo on the snare drum so that it sounds a bit more rock and roll. Yeah, bass. I, th I think we'll add a bit more bass to that, actually, Paul. Sorry. Yeah. That sounds a bit better, yeah. A bit more full. Yeah. We're bringing out overdub cymbals. I think. Yeah, getting them at the right level. Then bringing out room guitars. you'll find as the rhythm guitars come in, they do tend to take up quite a lot of room in the sound of the track. So now what we're looking for is, usually you'll be, you might be hearing this track on a little transistor radio, and a bass drum is quite a big sounding thing. So we have in actual fact got to make it a bit less of a powerful sound, and so that it cuts through a bit more. Yeah. So we, we've got more of a click on it and it'll come through on a transistor radio really well. And it, we'll listen to that for a, for a while. And it's, it's also a good idea because the bass and the bass drum are usually both in the middle of the stereo. It's a good idea to, to split them apart just slightly so that the Maybe the bass drum is just fractionally to the left and the bass is fractionally to the right. And that will enable the snare drum to come panning through 